Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Christopher Brown, and I'm pleased and honored to welcome back to the show Dr. Raj Sherman. He is going to be talking with me about the healthcare system in Alberta. Dr. Raj, Raj, welcome back to the show. Chris, thank you uh, for this opportunity. It's an honor to be here. So, Raj, I want to start with this question. Is our healthcare system in Alberta at a critical point? Chris, healthcare nationally across the country, and including Alberta, we have a major, major crisis. 30 years of working in the front lines in healthcare in an inner city hospital in Edmonton, uh, systems at a tipping point. You call 911 in the city, ambulance doesn't show up for half an hour to an hour. In a small town, but maybe doesn't show up for a couple of hours. You go to emergency, unless you're a cardiac arrest or a knife in the chest or a massive heart attack, you're waiting anywhere up to, you know, recently it's been 15, 16, 17, 19 hours in Red Deer last week. It's people suffering in pain. And many people wait and then they leave after a while only to come back if they're really sick. We have surgery waits for so long. You know, family doctors, people don't have a family doctor. It's a really big access crisis in rural Alberta. Their emergency departments don't even have a doctor covering the ER. So I believe the system is at a tipping point and soon as it snows and everybody moves inside and the viruses circulate, and the staff who aren't on schedule go on holidays and fly south. We're going to literally have people dying in our waiting rooms and dying to wait to get into care. And so that's why did, I'm here to discuss solutions and problems and solutions. So when did this start? Because I've relatively, I'm a relatively newcomer to Alberta. I, I moved here in uh, 2013. I have had my fair share of experiences with the healthcare system, as many people who listen to the show know. Um, I got in prior to the pandemic, which is very helpful for me. But when did this tipping point start? Because the tipping point is, we are at the tipping point, but there had to be a catalyst moving up to this tipping point. So for you, who has worked in the healthcare field, when did this start? Is this just because of COVID or did this start way before COVID? You know, our healthcare system has been challenged for many years. The system was run at a 98 to 102% capacity. And as you know, amongst the G8 nations, Canada is at the bottom of the list. And in Alberta, we spend among, amongst the most in the country. You know, once you get into care, it's actually really good care. The problem is getting in. That's the issue. COVID really highlighted a bunch of issues. With COVID, two year, years of COVID, so we've had two years of uh, people didn't, and most people didn't have a checkup. I'm a doctor and I couldn't get in to see my own doctor. People didn't have a real face-to-face -face checkup. Many surgeries were canceled. You know, during the Delta wave alone, there were 15,000 surgeries that were canceled. So we have a lot of catch up to do. In two years of COVID, frontline staff haven't had a break. We're burnt out. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty tough guy. Us guys in the front line in the inner city, we're tough and we can handle, and frankly, it's darn tough. And um, with the world opening up, people had two years of banked holidays. Whoever's not on schedule to work was taking their vacation. So it's a supply demand issue. We have a lot of demand for healthcare out there, acute care, surgical care, 911 emergency care, and the ability to supply that care has been significantly reduced because um, people are choosing to work a little bit less and they're exhausted and they're burnt out. A lot of staff ourselves, we're human beings. We get sick like anyone else. And we're waiting to get into care if we're sick. I, I want to I want to separate the two issues right here that we've talked about already, and that is the EMS issue. With if you call nine one one and then you you're looking for an ambulance to arrive, you are potentially not going to have one, or you're potentially going to be waiting for a while to get one. And the wait times at hospitals and AHS. I want to separate those two issues right now, and I want to stick to one issue, and I want to start with EMS. The call nine one one. We are seeing an abundance of paramedics. We are seeing uh, people take time off because of mental health leave. We are seeing issues around uh, uh, wait times and even firefighters needing to go to calls now because the EMS isn't there. Is this a new phenomenon that we are living in when it comes to our uh, EMS being such shortage because of the COVID-19 pandemic? Or has this been building up over time and the COVID-19 pandemic sort of exacerbated the whole issue around wait times and call times, I should say? 
Chris, it's it's all interrelated, and your it's latter point is the your latter point is a correct one. Uh, it's an old problem that's gotten much much worse because of COVID. There's a lot of illness out there in the community, a lot of chronic disease that didn't get managed the way it ought to have because of lack of access to care, and and lack of family doctors. Um, so really, if you look, it's all interrelated. Our hospitals in Edmonton and Calgary. If I told you 30% of the hospitals are plugged up by people who shouldn't be in hospital, seniors or the homeless or the ones that are severely mentally challenged and there's no place for them to go in the community, they're plugging up acute care hospitals beds, surgical wards, cardiac wards with the wrong nurse, the wrong doctor, wrong ward. They're not medically ill. They need to be somewhere else. You know, they need to be a long-term care facility, the seniors, not all of them. They could be at home in assisted living facility or they could be at home in their own home if we had better home care, better community supports for the seniors and the vulnerable. It doesn't make sense to have somebody who's homeless in an acute care hospital waiting to be placed if they can't care for themselves. So let's get those people out of hospital and let's stop them from coming in in the first place, which is a major investment in the community. Let's invest in people, caring for people in the community so your hospital beds can be used as hospital beds. If we did that, our emergencies are plugged up by people who should have been upstairs yesterday or the day before. They're sick. They need to be admitted. But the emergency is plugged up by people who should have been upstairs, uh, you know, a day or two ago. And that's why the waiting EMS waits happen. The EMS can't put people on the, on the floor in emergency and walk away unless they're the walking wounded. And, and that's causing the EMS crisis as well. So... A lot of, on the demand side, a lot of people with chronic disease that are acutely ill, that require family doctors. Many of them require acute care. Many of them require hospitalization. And we got to get the hospitals, people that shouldn't be in there out of the hospital so we can function as a hospital. Where, where would you put them? Because right now we have a we have a supply problem right now where we don't have the resources. And there, it, it's not going to fix just like that. If we throw money at a problem, it's going to take time to fix the problem. And if we've we, we put money into community resources for seniors or homeless people or houselessness people, it's not going to fix overnight. So what is step number one? Because every day that passes, we are filling up hospitals. People are, like you said, walking out of the emergency room. People are taking an ambulance, if they get one, to the hospital. And then they're waiting 15, 16 hours and then just walking back home because there's no point of waiting. So what is the solution that we can start with? Because every journey takes the first step. And right now we have Minister Copping, Jason Copping, the Minister of Health, Premier Daniel Smith. They are just, well, Minister Copping isn't, but Daniel Smith is new into the role of Premier. How can they start trying to fix this? Or is this a municipal level that they need to start looking at as well? Chris, it's an easy problem. When I was a member of government in from 2008, and I left government in 2010 and became independent, I warned our government at the time, two issues. When they created AHS, how they created it, I, as a centralizing everything is going to be a problem. We should just centralize the things that need to be centralized, keep delivery local. Centralize the bulk purchase, purchasing of goods, the capital spending, the standards of care, the electronic health records, HR, centralize those things, but, but decentralize, keep, keep delivery decentralized. And on getting the seniors out, we don't need more buildings. All we need to do is change the funding model on all of those who look after seniors in the community, whether it's the public senior system, the non-for-profit, community-based system or the for-profit. At that time, the government changed the funding not to have a RN on duty 24 hours a day in the building, to have them on call. I said, that's a bad idea because people are living longer. Their care is more complex. Healthcare is very complex. Not only do we need an RN on duty 24 hours a day in these facilities in the community, we need to hire all the nurse practitioners out there to work inside primary care networks and give a higher level of support. So that way, all the facilities that have been built, whether they're for-profit, private, or community-based, they just need funding so they can run more long-term care beds and hospice beds in their buildings, which means they need more funding so they can hire that higher level of skilled staff. This is how we do it. 
Because right now under the current funding model, uh, we put a senior into one of those facilities. Uh, their needs are so high that they don't have this qualified staff. So they just bring them back to hospital two weeks later saying we can't look after them. So that's one issue. Sorry, Number I'm going to interject here for a second because staffing is always going to be an issue because we, I, and this is from my perspective and you correct me if I'm wrong because you, you have been on the front lines. People aren't walking up and saying, you know what, I want to go to be an RN. I don't. I want to go be a doctor. I want to be this, that, or the other um, in the medical field. It's just not happening. And we are seeing people retire and the replacements aren't coming through. How do we fix the staffing issue when we don't have people to replace the, pe the people who are retiring or leaving or going on medical leave because of the overwhelming workload that they've had? Well, first thing we have to do is sign all the contracts, outstanding contracts with everybody in the system. The nurses have a contract and the doctors just got a contract a few weeks ago. So we need to sign all the contracts with all the staff that we currently have, because right now we're bleeding staff. Number two, leadership at all levels needs to acknowledge the effort, heroic efforts of all staff who literally put their lives on the line to deal with this deadly virus. You know, I caught this virus pre-vaccine and I was sick as a dog for three to four weeks. So we need to acknowledge their heroic efforts and thank them and to really improve the morale of staff. So if we can encourage staff that have cut back or left, we need to bring them back into the system, work with them to ask them what we need to do, how we can bring them back. Secondly, you know, I think immigration, the federal government needs to work with all healthcare ministers across the country. We also need to immigrate a whole bunch of staff. There are countries that have policies where they actually overtrain healthcare staff. That's your economic policy. They work abroad, they send money home to send, you know, the Philippines has an economic policy to produce a lot of nurses. And let's send our educational institutions and our those who give licenses here, let's connect there with, the, with their educational institutions so that they have the training before they come. So immigration is a major issue. And we need to invest in education of our own homegrown staff. Let's invest in post-secondary education into healthcare. There's a massive investment that needs to happen. You think um, people want to go into the healthcare field, though? Seeing what seeing what the, know, the healthcare field was under for the last few years, do you think more and more people, like the kids who are in high school right now, going, you know what, uh, I want to go and become an RN or a nurse or a nurse practitioner or a doctor or an oncologist? Do you think people are willing to actually are are, are kids and students in high school right now? are looking at the medical profession as something that is an, a viable option for them because we are seeing, and I'm just gonna use your words here for a second, Raj, um, they haven't been given the thanks that they should be given over the last few years. Well, Chris, this is why it starts with the leadership and building morale. If the leadership of our province and our country can engage frontline healthcare workers into repairing the system, Part of the reason frontline staff are demoralized is because they have not been engaged in building and running the system that they're the experts in. We ask all frontline staff to give anonymously saying, give us problems and solutions in what needs to be done. And we and the leadership actually listens and engages them. You know, it's like running any business. Whoever has demoralized staff is not going to have a good business model. And when people are engaged, and they feel that they have meaningful work that they do, they're going to show up early, leave late, and go above and beyond their call of duty if they feel that their contribution is actually valued. That's the key. If you actually value frontline staff for doing their job, I think we can get out of this. It's not going to be easy. This is, it. This is the most difficult puzzle in the world. How do we repair healthcare and put it back together? So that's number one. So Let's work on the seniors. We don't, if we got all our seniors a vulnerable out of hospitals, we don't need to build any more buildings for the seniors. Like for instance, my dad, mom and mom was burning out. Dad, dad, dad passed away years ago, God bless his soul. They were living together. So there's something called a choice program. So dads would pick up dad, take him to grandpa and grandma daycare for six hours. Mom got a break. Mom was basically his nurse. The taxpayer didn't pay for the building or the lights. A home care nurse came twice a week to bathe our dad. He was a big, he was a redneck lumberjack, big guy. So one needed help to give him a bath. 
he died comfortably in his own bed beside my mother. So just investing in simple things, senior day support programs, something simple like that actually keeps seniors out of hospital. You got healthy people getting sick from acute ill people in hospital. They're not sick, they're just wobbly. They just need a bit of home support. The Danish did deliver such good home care and hospice care. Most of our seniors won't need long-term care. We need to look at the Danish model of how home care and hospice care is delivered. And it's the lowest cost, in the, it co saves money and you don't need buildings. So this is what I've impressed upon every leader. This helps acute care, it helps the ER crisis, helps the surgical crisis because surgical beds are occupied by seniors who shouldn't be there. And, and, it's, and it solves and it helps with the 911 crisis. Second issue with the homeless occupying, hey, we can just buy or rent a bunch of hotels, house them in the hotels once they're medically fixed up and put the mental health and addictions wraparound services don't wait two years to build a building, just buy a couple of hotels. And uh, how's the homeless there? So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna push back on you there for a second here, Raj, because uh, we heard that during this last leadership campaign where uh, we should rent out hotels and put people there and turn hotels into or old hotels into hospital wings. Um, isn't that demoralizing though? Isn't that demoralizing when you go to get a uh, checkup or you go to get help at a hospital and um, let's be honest, you then get told, okay, we would love to help you, but we're going to go put you in this hotel now and you're going to go get the medical treatment there and not at the hospital. No, Chris, not at all. I'm not speaking of getting medical treatment in the hotel. The issue is, like, for instance, I work in the inner city hospital. We have somebody who overdoses and is homeless. We hospitalize them for two days or five days. We medically treat them in the hospital, but then we discharge them back to the street. And they're back in 48 hours with another overdose. I'm not suggesting we give health care in the hotels. Once the health care is done to somebody's homeless, let's house them in the hotel versus housing them in the hospital. What's demoralizing? And I'm not, I'm not suggesting we put seniors in the hotels. With the seniors, we just have to change the funding model in these seniors facilities to give them more money so they can hire higher level staff so they can provide the treatment in the olden days. We used to have these um, auxiliary hospitals. So these seniors facilities, private, public or non-for-profit can function almost like auxiliary hospitals and they just need to hire more staff. So the seniors should be there and it should be in their own homes. Because what's demoralizing, Chris, was, is when every citizen in the province calls 911 and that ambulance ain't going to show up when you need them. And every citizen in the province waits and waits and waits and waits, suffering meters from care in every emergency department across the province and the country. These are extraordinary times. And this is why these are going to require extraordinary measures in cooperation of everyone. Every leader in every medical profession and union, everyone in government, politicians, left or right wing, I don't care what wing you are, this is not a political issue, this is a human issue. It's going to require the cooperation of municipal leaders. In fact, this involves police, fire, EMS. This is a community problem. It's going to take our whole village to put our heads together saying, hey, who can offer what to get out of this crisis? That's just one part of it, getting people out of hospital who should not be there. You got people that should be in hospital, they're healthy and wobbly or homeless, and they're getting sick and infected from acutely ill patients. And every care, everyone's care is de de delayed. And the real long-term solution, you know, we need to start massive investment into educating our own population, our own young people, into getting them into healthcare professions, whether it's nursing, doctoring, paramedic school, labs. And we need family doctors in rural Alberta. The best way to get them, we need rural, not only family medical schools, we need rural health schools. Let's start educating our young people in doctoring and nursing and paramedic and lab into the smaller centers like Medicine Hat, Lethbridge, Grand Prairie, Fort McMurray, and um, Grand Prairie. Because if you educate rural kids in the big city, they're gonna meet somebody else who's young, get a life partner, and they're probably gonna stay in the big city. And you know, we're all connected, rural and urban, we're in this together. If people in rural Alberta don't get the healthcare, they don't have a doctor in town, guess what? 
they're going to be plugging up a hospital in Edmonton or Calgary, and people in Edmonton or Calgary aren't going to get into care. And the specialized care in rural Alberta has to come to the big cities because we can't deliver every aspect of super specialized care in every hospital in every town and city. So we have to solve this rural access crisis to healthcare. And long, medium long term is investing massively in post secondary education in rural Alberta. You, you, you mentioned at the beginning of the uh, conversation, um, once the snow falls, the tipping point is going to get worse. Well, the snow is falling. In Calgary, up in northern Alberta, the snow is falling. People are starting to take their uh, summer clothes off and put on their winter clothes. And people are heading inside and they are starting to... Uh, mix and mingle inside um how bad is it going to get before it gets better it's gonna get really bad so what do you mean I by am, that i am ringing the alarm bells right now because all the viruses are endemic and we're we're, we're going to have circulation of every virus in the community whether it's rsv influenza and hey, COVID still hasn't gone away. COVID is not killing the lungs like it used to with the, you know, the first variants of Delta, those were lung killers. So ICUs are okay with COVID, but hey, we got about 1100 people in hospital with COVID right now still, you know, seniors and the vulnerable. COVID is affecting them more than the flu would to get them hospitalized, to get run down. So but when we're gonna have every virus in the system circulating and every, the vulnerable and seniors, get so sick they need hospitalization it's going to be a major problem what do you mean by major problem like what do you mean by major problem because that's a very broad statement you just said there so like a major problem to me is uh like the healthcare system cannot hold it and the 18 hour wait times that you're seeing right now are going to be more like three day wait times that's a major problem to me what is a major problem to you raj it's going to be a ton of hospitalizations at a time is supply demand the demand for acute care it's not the runny nose and the sore throats coming to emergency that's the problem we don't even see them they wait 12 18 hours and they leave and most of them are going to be fine you know one out of ten might have something serious and we'll see them two three day, days later they'll be back heck of a lot sicker that's not the problem the problem is that we have a ton of sick people and they're going to need hospitalization we don't You know, we might have the physical space, we might have the physical bed and the equipment, we don't have the human staff. That's the issue. Could we see more surgeries canceled? Well, what happens is when people start, well, when people start dying in emergencies, then what happens is that we redeploy our assets in the system. And then elective surgeries get canceled. And they've already been put off for a year and a half. 15,000 were canceled during the Delta wave last year. And we haven't caught up. You know, the simple surgeries like cataracts, that's not a problem. That doesn't require a hospital bed. We're talking the hips and the knees and the cardiac surgeries, the major bowel surgeries, cancer surgeries, biopsies for every cancer there is. Hey, you can't get radiation and chemotherapy if you don't get your biopsy and you don't get your surgery, you know? So, and and you know about that. And the big problem is a lack of family doctors. So we have a number of solutions. Number one, we have to invest in primary care networks. We have to restructure the primary care networks. So they're financed, they're encouraged to roster the sick people with chronic disease that need caring. Right now, 60 bucks a patient, $62 a patient, human behavior is many of the PCNs have rostered the easy patients. Let's make the easy patient worth five bucks and the sick chronic disease patient who's in hospital a lot made 250, make them compete with that money the primary care network should hire all the nurse practitioners that are out there to work as a collaborative multidisciplinary team. In Canada, like in Alberta, we have one allied health professional working with four doctors, family doctors in the community. In the HMOs that are the best HMOs, Kaiser Permanente and Intermountain Health, they have four staff in the community that work with every doctor. So nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, dietitians, social workers, We got to invest in the community to care for people in chronic disease in the community. So family medicine becomes an easier job to do. You know, we don't have 50 emergency doctors in the ER. I do what I do. 
I diagnose a patient, examine them, write the treatment plan, but we have a fantastic team in emergency. We're a multidisciplinary team that provides you world-class care. Well, let's just do that in the community. So this is how the current family doctors could do a better job of looking after the chronic patients they have now. And may, they might be able to look after more patients if they have a higher team. And when we do that, more of our young medical students are gonna wanna do family medicine because it's a, it's a tough job. It's a tough job, especially in rural Alberta when you're all by yourself. So we need to get them the team. We have lots of doctors here that are from abroad who trained elsewhere. You know, some trained in really good medical schools, but they need to get a 90 day practice assessment done. And that requires post-secondary minister doing a targeted investment in the faculty of medicine. And they need to make AHS work with the faculty of medicine Is and work with the college of family physicians. Sorry, I just Let's wanna get ask them this. Into I wanna ask this question because, um, Compared to other provinces and territories in Canada, is Alberta like the norm of that 90 day wait time slash uh, family doctor issue? Or is Alberta on the lower end of the uh, issue when it comes to the access to family doctors, do you know? Well, you know, I, I can't comment on what the rest of the country is doing, but if you have somebody trained elsewhere, you know, some medical schools out there are, Fantastic, Brendan, and some, you know, <laughs> I, I don't want to talk ill of anyone, but, but, but God knows, you know, I, I know my home country where I'm from, if you're a wealthy guy and you have lots of money, you make a little donation, your child gets in and somebody's got 100% average, can't get in. So we want to, and secondly, we want to make sure people are up to our standards. And if they're not, and they're close, we need to create residencies, an extra six month residency or a one year residency to get people up to our standards. And then there's cultural competency and you know, doing a residency in a local community, you get to know what specialists work in the area. So we can't just take somebody off the street from uh, some other country and say, hey, have at her and go practice medicine on somebody in Alberta. It, that would be unsafe. I think it would be unsafe. Okay. But the second issue, Third issue, we, we, we have lots of our kids that trained abroad in good medical schools, Ireland and Australia. Let's assess them and let's bring them back home. So these are things we can do to immediately increase our labor supply. There's lots of American state, states now, conservative states where they have Roe versus Wade, Roe v. Wade. And you know, family doctors who deliver babies. Let's go down to the US, welcome them here. And the US doctors, we can get into our system really quick within a couple of weeks. I just talked to the College of Registrar of Physician Surgeons, said, hey, those American doctors, let's go down there. Let's, you know, I hate to poach, but if they're leaving, let's bring them here. But the long-term solution is we got to invest in rural family medical education. We need rural family medical schools and rural health schools. That's the medium, long-term, short-term is get, let's get the family, primary care networks, major investment, hire all the NPs, number two, get our, the doctors that are trained abroad that are in our borders, upgrade their training to our standards. Number three, bring our kids home. You know, the problem is we got other governments in our country poaching, robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're poaching from one another. And really, um, come who, on, we're in this together. Who plays a bigger part in this? Country. Who plays a bigger part in that? Does the federal government need to step in and say, okay, we're going to start working together and not have this like you just said, uh, poaching Peter to pay Paul? Or, or do the provinces have to go this alone and just sort of incentivize people to say, okay, we have it better over here. The grass is greener on our side of the fence. So come on over to Alberta. Like who plays the bigger role in this issue? Is it the uh, provincial or federal governments that need to actually step up to the plate and say, okay, guys, let's work together because at the end of the day, we're all Canadians from uh, Victoria Healthcare. to St. John's. Healthcare is a team game, Chris. As a country, we're in this together. Do you think people know that, though? You know, we're in this together. We have the Canada Health Act, the federal government. They used to contribute 50% to healthcare spending, 50-50. Now they're down to about 20 or 20, 20 or 25%. The federal government needs to make a major investment into helping all of the provinces. And secondly, on immigration, the federal government needs to do a better job of speeding up immigration, we don't want to steal from countries that are short staffed because that'd just be wrong. But there are countries that have policies to export healthcare staff, Eastern Europe, India, the Philippines, the federal government absolutely plays a major role uh, in doing this. Um, 
And what the provinces need to do locally, they must do on their own. And in fact, they can work together to share policies and best practices. And I would encourage every province, please don't steal staff from one another because, hey, we're in this together. That's a good thing about being Canadian. I've always said, what good is universal health care if it's universally unavailable when you need it? You know, the Canadian healthcare system, once you get into care, it's fantastic. And I love the fact that you don't have to ask somebody a visa card to get care. You know, it's great not to have to deal with private insurance companies and law groups and lawsuits as a doctor. We have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with our patients. I think the Canadian healthcare system is the worst saving, but I'm telling you, it's on the edge of the cliff and everyone needs to play a leadership role in doing this. We're in this, starting with the federal government and the prime minister and the federal uh, minister of health, and as well as all the premiers and all the ministers of health, down to the municipal leader, you know, where does the municipal the leaders come into this? Because we haven't spoken about them a lot. We talked about provincially because it, healthcare is a provincially mandated uh, requirement uh, or a, 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 a moment or you know what I mean. Uh, but where does the municipal government come into this whole factor? Do they have a part to play in this uh, discussion slash finding a solution? Absolutely. Everyone has a part to play, Chris. It's the social determinants of health. You know, there's health, then there's care. The hospital system is the care component. It's the health part, which is the community. You know, if you, you don't really have to invest in just doctors and nurses to repair the healthcare system. To deal with the demand side of the equation, it's creating urban planning, walkable communities. It's housing the homeless and getting the rat and the municipalities working with the healthcare system, you don't just need psychiatrists and psychologists to look after the homeless. Yes, there are mental health addictions issues, but you don't need a 15 year degree to provide much of the care and support that these poor people need, right? So the municipal governments absolutely play a major role in uh, the community capacity building to ensure those who don't need to be in the hospital can get out into the community and be housed and be given the community supports. We have a lot of do-gooders out there that would like to do good. If we all were working together, if the left hand talked to the right hand, this wouldn't be such a problem. I wanna talk about the sort of next few months. We, we've talked about the collapse of our healthcare system. We've talked about what we need to do, but in the short period of time that we have to sort of get the seniors out, get people who are houseless and get them into proper locations. What can the average person do? Because I've gone to the hospital and I think everyone has been following me along on social media. I go to the hospital every day and I can tell you that there are people in there with runny noses. There are people in there with a migraine, which there could be underlying causes there. There are people in there who I say, I look and I go, why are you here? You can just take a pill or you can go to your pharmacy and get a prescription because the pharmacists can actually prescribe some over-the-counter medication. What can the average person do in the short term to sort of help rectify these 19-hour wait times that we are seeing in Red Deer, at the foothills, at Peter Lougheed, up at the Royal Alex? Well, Chris, I'm glad you asked. You know, we all do have to, have to have a sense of personal responsibility for ourselves, our children, and our parents. You know, I would ask everyone out there, keep it. there's a lot of mental health right now. A lot of mental health young people have been struggling, mental health addictions issues. Number one, for yourself, you know, eat a healthier diet, you know, um, eat less, eat healthier, um, do your best to consume the stuff that <laughs> makes you sick when you end up in emergency walk a little bit more, get a good night's sleep. I'd ask every family, turn off the TV and everyone turn off your computer and turn off the cell phone, start having family dinner together. You know, talk to your children, talk to your kids and uh, go do things together that are physically active. Um, number one, if you have vulnerable parents, you know, care for them, call them, show up and help them out. Uh, my dad was sick and my mom couldn't look after him. I moved my parents in with me for five years and uh, being a good Indian son that's in fact every culture used to do this in the olden days you know um, except the third fourth generation forgot but many people still do this look after your own when they're vulnerable 
Um, it's not the runny nose and sore throat common emergency that's a crisis. It looks like they're causing the problem. We have 60 beds in emergency at the Royal Alex. But when you have 50 people that should have been upstairs uh, one or two days ago, we're operating an ER department out of 10 beds. The simple minor cases aren't even getting to a bed. In fact, most of those people leave without being seen. And if one of them is sick, well, you're going to come back heck of a lot sicker. And yeah, there's other health professionals that can help out. But, uh, but I've always said, if you need to be diagnosed, you need a doctor. If you're sick, you need to see a doctor. And once a doctor sees you, the other health professionals can help out. You know, then the pharmacist and, and, and the other health professionals can play a role. But if you're really sick, I'm sorry, you need our services. And healthcare is very complex, but we doctors can't do it on our own. That's where it's important to invest in the rest of the team so that we have more people in the community working with family doctors to provide the care Albertans need. What's the morale like at the hospitals right now from the staffing perspective? Because uh, for the average person doesn't see, they see a nurse, they see a doctor, they see an RN, they see a, someone when they go walk into the hospital because they expect it, right? They expect to see someone and they don't know the backstory. They don't care about the backstory because they are there to get help. And at the end of the day, that's all that they are focused on. But you, you've been there. You're all, you've been on the front lines. What is the morale like in the hospital right now from the staffing? We talked about they need a pat on the back, which is understandable. But a pat on the back only goes as far. Like they, that's a one minute in a one capsulation of a moment. There needs to be other things that we need to do. So from your perspective, what is the morale like right now heading into the winter months? Krista's staff over the last two years have suffered a great moral injury. COVID was really tough. We were morally very distressed and the morale is in the boots. It's worse than ever. Why? In 30 years of working, well, you know, we had the, unfortunately society got split between backs and unbacks. And I've always asked everyone, hey, please don't judge one another and let's, let's all get along together. And it was really difficult for staff to see a lot of the divisions in society and a ton of really sick people with COVID. And then everyone's sick. Everyone's care has been delayed. People used to have one problem when they were hospitalized. Now they actually have three problems that are out of control. The diabetes is out of control. The mental health is out of control. And they've had a heart attack. So we are dealing with the sickest of the sickest patients at a time when we're exhausted. So I would ask everyone, you know, be kind to one another out there, whether you're vaxxed or unvaxxed, please don't judge one another. Um, if you're sick, if you got the flu, well, stay home, don't infect your family, don't infect your community and your neighbors. We don't want mandates. Nobody wants to be told what to do, how to live their life. Uh, no, we don't want, nobody wants lockdowns again because the harmful side of the lockdowns we're seeing now because of the mental health issues, the social isolation and, um, and the fact that people didn't have a checkup for two years. So we're seeing, you know, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. If we didn't, uh, people didn't get vaccinated, didn't mask, we were, we were overwhelmed already with too many COVID admissions because of the lockdowns. Now we're overwhelmed with nobody having a checkup and the mental health addiction issues. So, so this is why it's a time for forgiveness, time for everyone to be kind to one another. Please don't spread any virus out there. Isolate yourself, you know. We don't want to tell anyone to wear a mask. We don't want to force people to wear a mask. But if the viruses are out there, uh, you know, I've been guilty of probably not wearing a mask all the time out there now. I've been vaccinated, triple vaccinated, and I've had COVID twice, <laughs> once pre-vaccine, once post. Um, do your best not to catch a virus and spread it. So these are things we can all do. It's going to be a real rough winter, regardless of what we do. And it's not going to be pretty. But we got to look after one another. I, so how do I say this? So during the height of the COVID-19, I was going through my first and second round of treatments after my first surgery. And uh, for cancer, for those who don't, who are tuning in, who did not know. And at one time I was having seizures and epileptic moments where I couldn't walk, I couldn't speak and I couldn't do anything. And there were days when I would have that. And I, my husband would say, we need to go to the hospital. And I said, don't, because even if we go, I'm not going to be able to get the care that I can. 
you talk about the mental health aspect of this crisis that we're heading into and we already are in and we are seeing people who are saying i don't want to go wait 19 hours at a hospital or 18 hours or even six hours even hell i don't even want to wait an hour at the hospital like i'm very happy that the the, the treatment that i'm getting i can walk in i can be out within an hour and a half two hours because i'm like the very first appointment every morning which i made sure i got that um, are people turning away from the healthcare system and just hoping for the best in today's society, do you think? You know, every, every day I talk to my colleagues in all the departments, every day you look at the screen, you know, our wait time goes from 17 hours in the morning when the new shift comes and then suddenly it drops in the morning, one, the new shift, but then there's something we have called Dr. L. Watt. LWOT, left without treatment. So there are days when you have 40 people that show up and leave without treatment and leave. They get to triage, sit in the waiting room, they get frustrated and leave. Many people just see the wait in the waiting room, a packed waiting room, then they leave. The problem with that is if they have something seriously wrong with them, they come back. We know they come back, you know? Um, and then come, come back heck of a lot sicker. So that's why I would ask everyone, number one, try to get in to see your family doctor first. And if you can't get in and you're sick, by all means, the ERs are the safety valve of the health system. And right now, the safety valves are all plugged up. If you're sick and you're waiting 10 hours, please don't leave. Go talk to the triage nurse, have them reassess you. We don't want sick people leaving the department. If you have to wait 12 hours, please wait 12 hours. Because once you get in, you're going to get really good care. And if you're sick, and if you're not that sick, hey, it's going to take us two minutes. You're not going to take up many resources. But if you're feeling really sick, you can't assess people over the phone. And you know, you don't know if it's indigestion or a heart attack till the doctor sees you. Is it a big bleeding ulcer or is it pancreatitis? We don't know. So if you tried the basic remedies like Tums or whatever for your indigestion, but you're still feeling unwell after hour or two, you know, if a heart attack shows up at hour, time is muscle. Every minute that we delay, that's more heart muscle that inj that's injured. If you delay it for 12 or 24 hours, we've missed the window. Your heart's damaged for life. So we want to see you with indigestion. <laughs> if you have it, please stay, talk to the nurse, uh, get your ECG done again. If it's a massive heart attack, we will get you in immediately. Just the little ones that don't show up on the ECG, those are delayed, unfortunately, and that's a problem. We are, so yeah, the runny noses aren't the problem. Most people with a runny nose and sore throat are going to end up being fine. But sometimes 5 or 10% 10, 10 of those folks are going to get really sick. They're going to have a bad pneumonia. They have an abscess in the throat. So you want to see a good health professional. Your family doctor is the best. Many patients in emergency are actually referred by the family doctor, by the medi centers, by the pharmacists, by chiropractors, by the nurse practitioners. They're referred to us by 811. So the problem is everyone in the system in every part of the system is busier than we've ever been. And I simply think we can do a little bit better job of uh, delivering healthcare, even given the horrible cards that we've been dealt. And that's gonna require leadership. Leadership starting at the top end with the government, the ministry. So let's, talk about, leaders. let's talk about leadership. Let's talk about leadership because we talked about issues. We've talked about problems, but let's talk about the leadership because the leadership needs to lead on this. And you and I can yell at and scream into the void until the cows come home. But until the leaders actually hear and actually do this, we don't know. You, uh, I, I would say, you know, Danielle Smith, our new premier of Alberta, you have worked across the aisle from her. Uh, do you think she's up to the challenge? Do you think she's up to the challenge where this is an issue that she's going to take serious? Because we've heard what she's said already, but we need the solutions that you've already come up with to start fixing this problem before, well, actually, I shouldn't say before, while we're in this problem, we need the solutions now. Do you think she's up for it? Do you think she has people around her, including Jason Copping, the Minister of Health, to fix this issue? And I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, Raj. It's just, 
this is not an issue that we can just sweep under the rug and hope that it gets solved tomorrow. We need hard discussions. And is she up for it, do you think? You know, I think every leader in our country is, 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 uh, is up to their neck in healthcare. Every premier. Number one, um, it's good to see, uh, you know, I got to know all the leadership con contestants and uh, I shared, while I wasn't allowed into the leadership race because I wasn't a member for six months, um, I gave everyone the Auditor General's report from 2017. And they had a good look at the whole system. And uh, starting with family, doctors, and accountability of things that need to be done. Um, we don't need any new studies. We don't need any new reports. I All the leadership candidates, like minus one or two, got a copy of that Auditor General's report. Uh, Danielle has, Premier Smith has told me that she's read majority of it. Secondly, uh, who's running healthcare for you? You know, we had talked. Uh, my, it's good to see that Minister Copping stays in his spot. He understands, you know, we can't be changing ministers and deputy ministers every 12 months. Um, it's a complex file. It's the most complex file in the country. So it's nice to see that she's kept Minister Jason Copping there. He's a good guy. You know, he just signed a contract with all the doctors. We, we had issues earlier on with the contract got torn up. Uh, I don't want to speak ill of anyone. but. Um, the medical profession is happy with the current minister and the minister needs to work with the medical profession, everyone to work on solutions to get out of this. So um, it remains to see, be seen who becomes the interim administrator. The premier has indicated that she intends to dissolve the board of AHS. Um, that, that had happened in 2013, minister, I believe it was minister Fred Horn. You may have to correct me, but at that time- It was. The premier Redford came in. <laughs> When Premier Redford came in, it was a new premier. At that time, the board, the HS board was dissolved. And in fact, the CEO, Dr. Eagle, uh, was removed by the minister at that time. And we had an interim um, manager as well at that time. I, I believe it was Dr. John Cowell. So it depends on who takes that spot. It's the most complex file healthcare. Whoever comes in needs to have an idea of what they're doing and uh, who to talk to and what the solutions are. Why is healthcare the biggest issue? Why is healthcare always the one that always seems like everyone wants to fix it, but when they get in, nothing ever happens? Why is that? And I'm not trying to be rude here because we saw with the NDP, we saw with the PCs, we saw with the UCP, healthcare has been like the thorn in everyone's heel that they know that they want to fix, but somehow, some way, healthcare is never the issue that gets solved in a four-year mandate or a 12-year mandate or hell, a 44-year mandate. Why is healthcare always being that issue? Is it because it's always evolving and there's always new issues that come up or am I just looking at this as too far in depth? Healthcare affects everyone, every citizen and every family. Education you know, does too. Education is very important. In fact, my, many of the solutions to healthcare are in education. <laughs> in fact, if everybody, if all of our children graduated from school, I've said long term, if you really want to fix healthcare, we have to do what the Germans do. Let's start streaming our kids earlier in grade 10 or 11 to get them into trades. The trade could be nursing school, it could be pre med, it could be being a boilermaker or electrician. And so every citizen, every young citizen graduates with a skill and a trade and a higher paying job. That's what we call the social determinant of health. That's the long-term solution to healthcare. Having the most educated, healthy society, healthy, wealthy society. You know, it's not that the Europeans have the best health systems alone. They've got some of the most educated populations and diversified economies. That's a 10 year solution to fixing healthcare. But healthcare affects every individual access to care. Somebody's got, you know, we all have parents and grandparents that are ailing and aging, they're fragile. They have a heart attack, they have a stroke, they have cancer, diabetes. When children turn 18, we have a, a young population. We have a baby boom. When children turn 18, the pediatrician's offices are overwhelmed. It's a tough job. I used to be in pediatrics in 1991 in residency and I quit after a month and I went into emergency and trauma medicine because that was easier. You know, I was a family doctor prior to that. I was, a, I was a pediatrics and I was a rural family doctor. I quit to work in the inner city ER because that's a way easier job. 
because we have a whole team working with us. You know, children, they turn 18 and they get fired by the pediatrician because they got to make room for the new children that are being born with their baby boom. And they're last in line to the adult health system. It's not the seniors that are going to bankrupt our health system. It's their children and grandchildren who are getting sick at a much earlier age with the chronic disease of their grandparents because inactivity and all these computers and mental health issues and, uh, and poor nutrition because of all the processed foods you know, we, we, got our, we got young people in their 20s having type 2 diabetes and hypertension, add to that obesity, mental health issues. We have 30-year-olds having heart attacks, and we can manage them for 40 years. So it's not the seniors. Don't blame the seniors. It's their descendants getting chronic disease at a much earlier age. And this thing isn't going away. Secondly, healthcare is about up to 50% of all health spending in every province. We spend more than a quarter trillion dollars a year. And every ministry is being cut because healthcare expenditures are going up, but access to quality care is going down. So this is why healthcare is not going away. How many premiers have we had since I got elected? Let's count them. In 2008, I called it a crisis and uh, I disagreed with my government and became an independent member. We had Premier Stelmack, Premier Redford, Premier Hancock was in term. God bless his soul, Premier Prentice. We had uh, Premier Notley. We had Premier Kenny. And now we have Premier Daniel Smith, you know? And how many ministers have we had? How many deputy ministers have we had? How many CEOs of HS have we had? And how is this working out? We need to take that Auditor General's report and look at it as a society. And we need to start implementing those recommendations. The federal government needs to take leadership and work with the provincial leaders to step up and, and give the provincial leaders more funding for their share of healthcare. And we need to immigrate a whole bunch of staff. Our provincial colleges, you know, we need to bring out something called rotating internship. In the olden days, we used to have hospital-based nursing training programs and every medical student uh, either did family medicine or did a rotating internship. Too many of young, young doctors have already decided in grade 11 or 12 what specialty they're going to do because it pays, the lifestyle is easier, and there's a lot more support. Family medicine and pediatrics, mental health, care of the seniors, these are the toughest jobs. And this is why for decades, most of our young people didn't go into family medicine or mental health or pediatrics or geriatric care. We need to incent our young people to go into those type of specialties in medicine, whether it's uh, as a doctor or as an allied health professional or as a nurse or nurse practitioner or as a physician assistant in the community. Well, you, you talked about education. You talked about getting kids when they're younger and getting them to the understanding that maybe family health care, while it may be harder, it is a good path that you can take. Um, we, I would love to say that that issue is going to be solved tomorrow. I would love to say that people would want to go into the healthcare field to go be a family doctor. There might be a few. I know my sister-in-law just went back to school for nursing because she saw it as a need in her community and she got a job right out of high school, right out of college. She's already been offered a job, if I'm not mistaken. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Else, and I do apologize if I'm speaking at a term, but I believe she has been offered a job in her like rural community in Ontario. Like it, the jobs are there. The jobs are there. It's just no one is thinking about, hey, I want to be a family doctor in my rural community because, like you said, I could go to Edmonton and find the love of my life and set up shop there because it's going to be a lot easier. How much responsibility do the rural doctors of today have to sort of say, we need to start saying this is an option for people because rural doctors may be the sort of the front line of education. We talk about teachers, but the rural doctors are the ones who are actually educating the people of saying, this is an option for you because we would love to have another doctor here and it's automatically a good job for you if you do. Well, you know, it's, uh, if you make the job fun, if you, one, if you make it a priority, number one is, the governments have to make this a priority across the country. And number two, 
Doctors need help. I was a rural family doctor in Nelson, BC in 1991. So, it was a geriatric doctor, practice. haven't you been? Let's just let's just I think that'd be a lot easier to stay there, Raj. You know, I'm a small town farm boy. My, I grew up on a farm in India. My grandpa was a rural doctor, so was my uncle. And I grew up on a small town in Squamish, BC. Us, the joke for us emergency doctors is we're jack of all trades, master of none. You know? <laughs> We're not the finishing carpenter, but we could probably frame a house, you know. <laughs> so, but um, but yeah, if you make if you make it a priority, and like I told you, it's e easier for me to be an inner city trauma doctor at the Royal Alexandra Hospital than it is to be a small town family doctor. Because we got lots of help and we got lots of support. You know, we got all the technology down the hallway. We got how many nurses working with us? Yeah, we're burnt out, but at least we got help. I'm not there all by myself. You got all the specialists in the hospital. So let's make it a priority. We have to invest in other healthcare workers supporting the work of family doctors. And, um, you know, let's get our kids in grade 11, say in grade 11 in all these small towns. If you do what the Germans did with their education, let's start our kids going into nursing and health professionals in grade 11. Um, and they have a co op term, they'll do two, three months to work with an adult who works, who's an expert in the area, they'll have a adult role model and they'll make some money. Our kids are gonna say, hey, now I gotta understand why I gotta do math. Now I gotta understand why I gotta take that course in biology. When they have real life exposure to that profession in grade 11 and then grade 12. And by two years out of high school, you could have a full nursing degree or a lab tech degree and make a lot of money versus, hey, I mean, I drop out in grade 11 or 12 and work on the farm or go work on, in industry. So, and, and we can catch up if we actually invested in the education, healthcare education in rural Alberta, in these smaller cities where we have college campuses and, and in high schools, we can get out of this. It's, it's gonna take a decade. It, it, it took a long time getting here, Chris. And two years of COVID really put us in the situation, really exacerbated the broken things in the system. But now that we know it's completely broken, let's work on the real solutions. Thing is, politicians make up crap all the time, and then they keep doing their stuff, and we front line, they're, come on, guys. We keep going, come on, guys. You got to listen to us in the front lines. You want to repair it? Engage us. Listen to us. We know what the solutions are. And lastly, education. If you really want to fix healthcare, let's put a, one of those ATCO trailers in every school parking lot. Let's put a mental health nurse and bring back that school nurse that we used to have in the olden days. Let's deliver school health and community health. You don't want to force people to be vaccinated, but let's vaccinate the whole community under those ATCO trailers. Vaccinate the kids first for the families who want their children vaccinated and, and then vaccinate the parents and the grandparents. And let's talk about school, school health. Let's start a breakfast and lunch programs and you know, low, low risk areas where kids are coming to school hungry and they're not eating healthy food. That's how you really fix healthcare. And let's connect the primary care networks to the schools. The nurse practitioners can work in partnership with family doctors to deal with all these sick kids we got coming down the pipeline who have mental health issues and the type two diabetes or type one diabetes. And we have young kids with blood pressure issues. Let's diagnose them early, treat them early. So it doesn't get out of control by the time they're 25 and 30. This thing is not going away, Chris. Education is a major resource to fixing healthcare. Well, how are you? Unfortunately, what are you doing? Because I want to I just look, I just saw the time. I was cautious of that, but I was like, oh wow, we've been talking for an hour here almost. How do we like what do we, what do you need to do? What do we all need to do? Because we talked about the solutions of what the provincial, federal, uh, like us as people need to do, but how do we start this conversation to get people to say, realize, okay, healthcare is in crisis and we are about to be a broken healthcare system where even the worst case scenario would be the best case scenario in about six weeks from now, because it's going to be worse before it gets a lot better. Well, I took, for me, I've, I, I took some time off the emergency room. I had to tell my colleagues, you know, we have a, uh, political instability for the next year. There was a leadership race and we have an election coming. So I'm out here educating and advocating. Do you think healthcare is going to be a major issue in the next election? 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Every election, if every provincial government across the country, healthcare is going to be a massive issue. And um, I'm educating and advocating uh, while being on your show right here. A number of people are going to see the show. They may agree or disagree with some of the things we talk, but I'm hoping that they'll talk about it. I want everyone to talk about healthcare with their families and their communities. Uh, this isn't an NDP or liberal or UCP issue. This is a human issue. It affects every individual, every family, every community. You know, when young families want to move to rural Canada and rural Alberta, if, you know, if you're a young couple, you have kids. Well, you're going to go there. If there's no health care available, there's no education available, and no fun, fun things to do, we have deep population of rural Canada of young people. Young families to settle there, we need these things. We need education, health care, and all the other things uh, for a healthy society. I can so, tell, yeah, I, I can tell you that during the month of October, we had a month-long series of municipal leaders. And during our com my conversations with about 20 municipal leaders from across this country, every single one of them, every single one of them, and I, I, you can go back and check the records, they talked about how healthcare is a municipal issue now, and it is becoming a worse municipal issue that they did not expect to be dealing with because they, they know it's a provincial issue, but residents aren't caring about what provincial or what jurisdiction healthcare is in. They want solutions to it, and municipalities are having to face that issues, particularly, like you said, rural municipalities where healthcare is becoming a uh, less and less of a prominence in it that they used to be. So healthcare is something that we need to advocate for. And I'm glad that someone is starting this conversation because we need it, right? Well, you know, the conversation has been around. I just want to depoliticize it. Let's not lay blame on anyone. Um, we're probably all partly to blame, you know, every organization, but we also all have solutions. I'd say, hey, this is gonna require the combined effort of everyone, whether it's federal, well, actually, federal politicians, provincial politician, municipal politicians, the leaders of every organization involved with healthcare, you know, even policing, if you're gonna form a board, a future board of AHS, you should have uh, one, people who understand healthcare and the business of healthcare, but you also need the municipalities and patient advocates um, and people, you know, engineers would know how to manage healthcare, flow process improve engineers uh, from Toyota, Lean Six Sigma. Not one individual, Chishu, if I was the premier and I was the health minister, I alone can't fix this thing. One person alone can't do it. Two people can't do it. It's going to require the combined effort of the community. Like they say, it takes a village to raise a child. I'm telling you, it's going to take the whole village to care for all our sick and vulnerable and our elderly and our young and our homeless. And that's why I say to fix the care system of the healthcare, we have to focus on the health part, the prevention part. Let's not get sick in the first place. Let's not get so sick so you have to be in a hospital in the first place so it can be available for you when you need it. And that's why the solutions really lie in the community, in education and prevention, the long-term solutions, the medium, the short, medium, and long-term. And it's time that we involve the leaders of all the municipalities in repairing the current healthcare system that we currently have. I've always said, the country needs leadership. And I told the premier and every other candidate saying, hey, you're gonna have to have the courage to call this a crisis, to say that the system is broken and the courage not to blame anyone, and the courage to ask for help from everyone. Because if we in Alberta can do what's required to repair it, the medium term and long term fix, I believe the rest of the country will follow suit. If one thing I know about Alberta, Albertans usually have the courage to try something different and new. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity. I would encourage, um, Premier Smith and former Premier uh, Notley to get on the same page on healthcare and encourage them not to bicker and do something amazing saying, hey, let's work on this together to repair it. We can do our politics in, in April or May when it's time to politic, but until then, 
we're in this crisis together. And I'm telling you, people are suffering already. They're dying in waiting rooms already. They're dying to wait till that 911 ambulance to arrive. And you know, we got to fix this damn thing because this can't go on any further. Well, Raj, I want to thank you so much because we need people like yourself advocating for these uh, solutions, but also advocating for people to actually, you know, have a sit down conversation and try to come up with a solution that's unpolitical and non-political at the end of the day. Um, we would love to have you back on the show to continue this conversation because we know that ooh, this is one drop in the bucket of this conversation that needs to have. We will try to have other representatives on as well to talk about the fixes that we need to have for healthcare. So thank you so much for spending the last hour with me and talking about how do we fix healthcare? Because I feel like we, we've we come up with solutions, but we've come up with the drop in the buckets of what the solutions need to be. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. You know, I warned our government way back when. Uh, we, we, we were spending $12 billion in healthcare. And I warned them, if we didn't engage frontline staff and we centralized everything in AHS to one person, that I'd be talking to them 10, 12 years later, that we'd be spending double and it'd be way worse. And here we are, we're spending almost $24 billion, and healthcare has never been so bad before. Having said that, I'm a never optimist. <laughs> we don't need more money. We just need to spend our money a bit better and we need to be a bit smarter. And I think we can manage healthcare a bit better. I think we can get out of it. I'm, I'm optimist. I think, I think we're going to get out of this. It's going to be, it's not going to be easy, but we can do it. So thank you, Chris, so much for this opportunity. This is just the beginning. I'm stepping out. So I'll hopefully be doing a town hall in your neighborhood in the next, uh, between now and election time. We will talk about healthcare. We will certainly come and see that as well if I'm up for it, because right now I'm in this virtual bubble that is called chemo and radiation. So I'm not going too far from my house beside back and forth from the hospital. But Raj, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And reminder to everyone listening and watching this right now, put down your phone after you've finished listening to this and go have a conversation with somebody. Go, like Raj said, go have a conversation with someone about healthcare, about something you heard today and say, okay, maybe those two are up shit creek without a paddle and send us some comments. We would love to hear them because you know what? We can't grow as a society and we can't come up with solutions until we hear from everyone. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. Put down your phone, put down social media, go have a conversation with somebody. And remember, just keep talking. Thank you.